In the NVIDIA GTC conference, their CEO Jensen Huang demonstrated how prompt engineering is the new coding. He introduced the NVIDIA Inference Microservice, or NIM, that basically bundles together all the software that you need in order to build and deploy an AI application in any domain that you want, mostly through prompt engineering. You only need like three lines of code or less. For example, if you're a healthcare company and you have a lot of data on cancer genetics and imaging, you can deploy an AI application that's able to analyze all of the data that you have and come up with novel targeted drugs for specific types of cancer in literally minutes. And what's interesting is that just a few weeks back in a conference, he said, It is our job to create computing technology such that nobody has to program. Basically, coding is dead and the future is in prompt engineering. Now couple this with Devin. And today I'm really excited to introduce you to Devin, the first AI software engineer. And here is Devin being prompted to benchmark the LLM Llama 3 on three different types of API providers. I'm gonna ask Devin to benchmark the performance of Llama on a couple of different API providers. From now on, Devin is in the driver's seat. We'll come back to this example later because the prompt itself over here holds the key to answering the question. Is prompt engineering truly the new coding? You will leave this video understanding what Jensen means by nobody will need to learn coding anymore and what you should be focusing your attention on instead. In 1843, Ada Lovelace wrote algorithms for a mechanical general purpose computer. She's often celebrated as the first computer programmer. Now moving to the mid 20th century, people usually call this the birth of modern programming. Looking forward 20 years, I'm quite certain that the coming of the computer will have a significant effect on all businesses and most private lives. During World War II, the first electrical computers were developed such as the Colossus, which is used by British codebreakers, and the ENIAC in the United States. This time period was also when assembly code introduced, so you no longer have to do the 010101s. This development made coding so much faster, and there was quickly other, more higher level languages that were developed, such as Fortran in 1957, which was developed by IBM, and COBOL, which was developed in 1959 for business data processing, as well as LISP for artificial intelligence research. Contrary to what a lot of people think that AI was something that is like this newfangled thing, actually AI research started in the 1960s. At this point, coding was a lot easier and faster, but compared to modern times, it's not even close. For example, this is Margaret Hamilton standing next to the code that she wrote to get Apollo to the moon. She was also the first one that came up with the term of software engineer. Keep that in mind. This is very important and we'll come back to this later. But first, let's finish our history lesson. The 1970s saw the development of an even higher level programming language called C. This is a language that's now able to support complex data structures and algorithms, which greatly facilitated the development of very complex large software systems. Moving into the end of the century, the 1980s saw the rise of a lot of software engineering principles, which was quickly adopted with the advent of C++, an inherently an object-oriented programming language. And of course, finishing off the century is when the internet came about. But it's very hip to be on the internet right now. This led to the need for languages that supported web development, starting off with HTML, CSS, then JavaScript in order to enable dynamic web content. Finally, going into the 21st century, everybody was on the internet and these things called smartphones became very popular. So did mobile development. This of course led to a development of lots of different new languages, as well as frameworks that can make sure that the software is more scalable, more safe, and faster to write. These languages and frameworks became more and more abstracted away in high level, like Python, Ruby, React, and TensorFlow for machine learning. A lot of people who use these high level languages genuinely don't even know about how memory management works, which was like a huge thing just a decade ago. But yes, finally now going into the 2020s, the decade that we live in now, this trend of things being more and more abstracted weight does continue. With so much data that's being collected, there's now a huge emphasis on artificial intelligence, where machine learning, as well as data science. Developer tools and environments such as Docker, Kubernetes, and cloud-based platforms are becoming 
becoming more and more popular as we build and run more and more complex software. As you can see, the trend that has been going on since the 1940s is that you have something super tedious and somebody comes along and abstracts some of these concepts and processes to make coding simpler and faster. And then somebody comes along again and does the same thing to abstract more things away so it becomes simpler and faster, so on and so forth. Regardless of how prompt engineering and traditional coding intermingle and develop moving into the future, I think we can all agree that prompt engineering is a must learn skill in order to be more productive in life and in work and eventually be able to develop AI products and tools. The easiest way to start practicing prompt engineering is through ChatGPT. Luckily, you don't need to figure things out yourself from scratch. HubSpot has a full ChatGPT bundle that contains hundreds of prompts that you can start using to practice prompt engineering. The resources are really well laid out and they give you lots of ideas on how you can incorporate ChatGPT into your work and your life to make you much more productive. For example, have you ever had to gather a lot of information and read through a lot of information to prepare for a presentation or a report? ChatGPT is actually really good at this. It's able to consolidate a lot of different articles, tutorials, and different resources. It can be your virtual assistant, your personal concierge, your writing assistant, and so much more. My favorite high ROI section is being able to automate my emails and to be able to filter through news because there's just way too much news out there and not enough time. The best part of this bundle, it is completely free. You can download it at this link over here, also linked in description. Thank you so much HubSpot for providing these free resources in order to help us leverage the power of AI and for sponsoring this portion of the video. Now back to the video. Engineering. Engineering, come in. Prompt engineering is defined as the process where you guide generative artificial intelligence, generative AI solutions to generate desired outputs. Like for example, you can ask Devin to come up with a benchmark comparison for Llama being run on three different API providers. Then it comes up with these comparison numbers and even makes a nice little grab that gets deployed. Now let's compare that to a definition of coding, which is the process of creating instructions that computers then interpret and follow. To do the same thing of benchmarking Llama on three different API providers, you would use a high level modern programming language such as Python or some flavor of JavaScript. You need to read a documentation to figure out exactly how to use these APIs, run the code to run Llama, the large language model, record the time it takes, then explain explicitly create that visualization and deploy it while probably wasting a lot of time just debugging things because things rarely work the first time. As you can see, to accomplish the same task, coding is a lot more complex and a lot more time consuming. But what I want to point out is that prompt engineering and coding using Python or JavaScript or whatever language actually still follow the same process. First, you have some input or instruction, whether that be through a prompt or code. Then you have some sort of processing that happens, whether that be within artificial intelligence or directly to the computer itself. And finally, you get this desired output of that nice little visualization that got deployed. So you see, from modern day coding to prompt engineering, it actually follows that same trend since the 1840s. You have some sort of computation process to get the output that you want, but someone comes along to make this tedious process a little bit easier by abstracting away some things. Though still following that similar process of having some sort of input, some sort of computation processing that happens, and then your desired output at the end. So it really does seem like prompt engineering is just the evolution of coding, doesn't it? Since grad school. When I was doing my degree in the University of Pennsylvania, one of the first classes that I had to take, which forces you to start from the lowest level programming language of assembly code, then moving up to C and C++, Java, and then Python. I still remember wanting to JMP out of the window when it took 30 lines of code just to write a for loop. If you know, you know. Basically, if you don't, that's like the command or function that you have to use in order to go from one line of code to some other type line of code. Anyways, it was an awful experience and I have definitely had times when I have burst into tears and I had no idea why they put us through this because who still programs an assembly code? And for most people now, even C or C++ or even Java. But you see, after I graduated and got a job as a software engineer, I realized that that was one of the most important courses I have ever taken. Because from forcing me to program at such a low level language and then going upwards, I was able to understand what was going on beneath the hood and the concepts of engineering principles that's been abstracted away these days, as well as how to think critically, build things, and continue coding despite tears streaming down my face. These concepts of engineering principles is now why I'm able to learn languages so quickly, to grasp new technologies and learn how to use them very, very quickly. You see, there's a difference between coding 
and engineering. Coding is just the way that you're getting a computer to do certain things, but engineering is figuring out what it is and what's the best way to build the thing that you want to build. Going back to Margaret Hamilton from earlier, whose contributions led to the successful landing of Apollo, she was also the one that came up with the term of software engineering. You see, before that, we were implementing pretty simple things, like just counting things, doing some addition, processing some things, like summing up some numbers, doing some simple calculations. But as the demand for computation increased and more and more high-level coding languages came about, we were able to write more complex pieces of software that call for more engineering principles on how it is that you should be building software so that it's fast, accurate, scalable, allows you to work in parallel with other engineers. So it's not just the language itself that's being more abstracted away and easier to use. These high-level engineering principles were also being developed. Concepts like data structures, algorithms, object-oriented programming, containerization. These are all fundamental developments and huge paradigm shifts for how we think about and develop software. Coding is simply the language we use in order to get the computer to implement these engineering principles to build the things that we want to build. Now, going back to this prompt itself to Devin. I'm going to ask Devin to benchmark the performance of Llama on a couple of different API providers. If you break it into pieces, the first part is, hey Devin, I'd like for you to benchmark Llama 2 on three different providers. Second part is replicate together and perplexity. Third part is figure out their API formats. And the fourth part is write a script that sends the same prompt slash params to all of them. Okay, so if you have absolutely no understanding of engineering or how any of these computery things work, first of all, how would you even have known that it's an important thing to benchmark Llama on different providers? Why are there even different providers? Why is there differences between them? Why do I care if there's any differences? Then of course, you need to know what are these different providers for figuring out their API formats. If you like don't know what an API is, like the concept of software interacting with other software, even if it doesn't matter how it is that you can pull from an API, still, how would you have like come up with this prompt? Then script, what is script? Why does it matter how it is that I'm sending the same parameters or the prompts uh, to these providers? Assuming again that I even know to care about the speeds of these different providers. Before y'all come after me and go like, oh, like these things eventually can be simplified as well. So you don't have to explicitly write things. No, 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 I'm not saying that it won't. I personally actually don't doubt that prompt engineering will become better and better and replace coding in the traditional sense. I agree that everybody can become a programmer at some point. And you don't need to learn specific languages like C, Java, Python, but what won't get replaced is the principles that govern data analytics, data science, and engineering. Being able to iteratively figure out what needs to be changed in order to get a better output. Figure out what even is the output that you want. You'll be surprised by how many non-technical people genuinely don't know what they want. Like two thirds of my job at Meta is going like, hmm, is that really what you want? If you're a software engineer, data analyst, data scientist, ML engineer, AI engineer, whatever, some sort of technical person, what you do isn't just coding. It's figuring out the right question, understanding the appropriate solution, and breaking it down into things that are actually actionable. Problem solving, critical thinking. Let's go back now to Jensen's statement. Nobody has to program. He says, nobody has to program anymore. Not, nobody has to be an engineer, a scientist, an analyst. But what to study? Now, finally, going back to the rest of Jensen was saying when asked about what people should learn these days. What would you give me as advice for something to pursue? If I were starting all over again, I would realize uh, one thing. One of the most complex fields of science is the understanding of biology, human biology. What he follows up with is also very interesting. Nobody in computer science, nobody says car discovery. We don't say computer discovery. We call it engineering. And every single year, our computer science, our software becomes better and better than the year before. However, life sciences is sporadic. Life science to life engineering is upon us. And that digital biology will be a field of engineering, not a field of science. Life sciences to life engineering. 
drug discovery to drug engineering. As someone who has a degree in both pharmacology and computer science, I can definitively say that as it currently stands, drug discovery, life sciences, and engineering are very different. Like seriously, most of the drugs we discover are actually just wandering around the universe and on a whim just discovering that a petri dish of bacteria is being killed by some sort of thingy that we now know as penicillin. And some dude wandering around the eastern islands playing around with dirt found this microorganism that just happens to produce an antibiotic which we now know as rapamycin. I hope that this is going to start a whole journey generation of people who enjoy working with proteins and chemicals and engineering these amazing things that are more energy efficient. All of these inventions are going to be part of engineering, not scientific discovery. I hope so too, that those of us who are engineers, data scientists, data analysts, technical people use our expertise to engineer solutions in the life sciences, drug discovery, climate change. Thank you all so much for watching this video. Please let me know what your thoughts are about this topic and I'll see you in the next video or live stream.